love reading popular books to see what all the fuss is about, but I also like finding gems. Finding books that after I read them, I want to pick up a bullhorn and tell everybody to read it too. The book we are going to be discussing today, The Blood Trials by Annie Davenport, is one of them. It is an adult novel with a blend of science fiction and fantasy, which I just love. It is the first in what I believe to be a duology, and I own the second book. I did want to make a video though about this one before I read the second one so that I remember the events that happen. But this series being only a duology is not something I'm a fan of. I think this world should have more books, but maybe that's just me. Hey there, it's Cherie. Hope you're doing well. On this channel, we talk about books, books, and more books. So if that is something you're interested in, go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss a new video. Now, I read The Blood Trials last year, but I am still thinking about it. It was my favorite book that I read last year, so I would think that I would still be thinking about it. But if you are a fan of The Hunger Games or Divergent, and I'll even throw Red Rising in there, I definitely think you would enjoy this book. But right now, let's just get into it. So grab a drink and some snacks. And just so you know, there will be spoilers. So in the first chapter, we get to see the type of person our main character, Akina, is. She's hanging out with her best friends, Celine, Rissian, and Zane, who have decided to put in their bid to become a Praetorian. Now, Praetorians, they are the most fearful and respected soldiers in the Republic of Marine. And Akina, she doesn't want anything to do with them. She really just wants to drink. She's also dealing with the death of her grandfather, Vern Amari. So this is how she is choosing to deal. She also ends up up getting into a little old bar fight which that guy I don't condone violence but that guy kind of had it coming he really should have kept his mouth shut I mean he shouldn't have been talking trash about the death of a grandfather and of course this guy was one of those the people that think you're just skin color and a woman so of course you're beneath me of course you couldn't beat me in a fight not even possible well he found out. During this chapter, we also end up meeting Darius, Reed, and Chance. They are Praetorians. They are also the instructors over the Praetorian aspirants, which will be Zane and Selene. We also end up meeting Rajar Brock, a family friend and the Tribunal Council's spymaster. He tells Akina that he believes that her grandfather might have been murdered, and Reed, Darius Reed, who we just met, might have something to do with it. Now I'm gonna start calling Darius Reed Reed throughout the rest of this video just because that's pretty much what he was called throughout the majority of the book. Just FYI. This is when Akina decides that she might just need to care about being a Praetorian after all. It could at least allow for her to get revenge on the people that killed her grandfather. It was said that her grandfather Vern died of a malfunctioning biochip which resulted in a heart attack and heart attacks are pretty rare for Praetorians. Also I don't know how I'm going to be saying Praetorians for the rest of this video. I feel like sometimes I'm saying Praetorians and sometimes I'm saying Praetorians and some other version sometime throughout this video. I don't know, just bear with me. But let's get into some quick world building of this story. I definitely think that would be helpful. So this book starts out in the Republic of Marine. I do love when sci-fi and fantasy novels have maps at the beginning of the book. They are rather helpful and I wish all of them had them. So there are two continents. The Republic of Marine is on the minor continent. It is next to the Ice Waste, the Free Microstates, the Kingdom of Kanai, the Federation of Life, and the Southern Isles. There is also the principal continent, which has the Empire of Akashia. That is where the Blood Emperor is. And if you don't know, the Blood Emperor is evil. He is pretty much the villain of this world. He is also Pantheon blessed, meaning he has gifts, pretty much magical gifts. He seems to want to conquer all of the lands. Not just have the principal continent under him, but the minor continent as well. You know, evil emperor stuff. Now, a bit of history. The men of the first Praetorian cohorts were warriors, exceptional fighters, and strategists that were not pantheon blessed. These cohorts were formed to fight for Marine. Other cohorts were formed as well to fight against the Blood Emperor. And the original Praetorian cohorts were Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and Epsilon. Am I saying that right? There is now a peace treaty that Vern Amari forced the Blood Emperor to sign during the war. Vern Amari fought the Blood Emperor one on one and somehow won. Um, I know Vern is considered to be a great fighter, but there is something else there. Something's not adding up. Hopefully I'll get to learn about that 
once I read book two. Now, Verna Mari had Kanayan blood and the people of Marine view Kanayans beneath them. So to have someone like Vern, someone with Kanayan blood, be the 44th Legatus commander and also the hero of the war, I am sure that did not sit right with people. Also, Vern wanted changes that happened in Marine. He wanted more equality. Definitely not something that sat well with some people. Akina, she hates the Blood Emperor. He is responsible for her mother's death after all. Makes sense. There is something else too. Akina happens to be Pantheon blessed and we see her use it on others when she mixes her blood with theirs. She is able to make people do things as well as forget things. We find that out when Cayman Rossi, top cadet from their graduating class, and also another Praetorian aspirant tries to take her out. The first time at least. Now, being a Pantheon blessed person in Marine is not ideal, especially since you can be executed if you are found out. Now, we've heard about Kina and we've heard about her grandfather, but what about her mother? Vern actually gave himself a daughter. Akina's mother was genetically manipulated and a surrogate was used. Now for Akina, her mother did things the old fashioned way. There really isn't much mention of Akina's father. She doesn't know who he is. I have my thoughts, but I'll leave my theories to the end. Now the members of Gamma's cohort would be Reed, Danica, and Haynes. This was Vern's cohort, Akina's grandfather. I consider if I actually wish to pledge Gamma. It was grandfather's cohort, the thing he rebuilt from the ground up. He made it what the Republic should be instead of the cesspool which it is. If I put my personal intentions with Rita's side, I can't deny that he, Danica, and Haynes make Gamma seem like it's still what grandfather made it. It's still a slice of the Republic that has all the virtues that he envisioned pushing through the whole of Marine one day. So Akina has to keep her magic a secret, but something happens where she ends up telling Selene about it. This thing could be great with them being friends and all, but it also did help put a strain on Akina's friendship with Zane. Zane knew that she was hiding something. I liked Zane. Now, before I say any more, I need to talk about the deaths in this book. I was quite sad in a few times. Zane and Dex, another aspirant. I had a feeling about Zane though. In chapter four, I wrote down that Zane or Enzo, also another aspirant, were going to die. I was saddened with Zane, but I did kind of expect it. He was a close friend, but I didn't think Selene would die, and I figured at least one of her friends would die. I'd say that Dex death was a bit unexpected, but I should have known when they introduced his sister Bex as well. They were going to keep both, but it didn't hurt any less. Oh, and Torn died early on, but I barely knew him. No offense. Now back to Selene. I just want to say that I don't want to believe it. I don't want to believe that Selene was pretty much a spy for her father in regards to Akina. That Akina being Pantheon blessed wasn't news to her. That she was relaying information back to her father about Akina. I don't want to believe it. I like their friendship. I would like to continue to like their friendship. There has to be an explanation. There has to. There has to be an explanation. I refuse. I refuse. I am glad that it turned out that Reed didn't have anything to do with Fern's death, but the way he acted when he found out about Akina's gifts, I mean, they were intimate and got close. So maybe he was just kind of in shock for her not telling him. Also, she did kind of grill him about who he was and his past. Not really fair for her to know his story and he not know hers. We also end up learning that Reed is half Kanayan. That's when Akina was grilling him, which would explain why Verda Mari took him under his wing and decided to train him. He doesn't really look Kanayan though. He has that Marine privilege. But like I said, Reed and Akina get close and Akina finally realizes that Reed was not one of the ones that killed her grandfather. She didn't realize it though before they were intimate, so probably a bit confusing. Oh, and remember how I mentioned that Cayman tried to take her out not just once? The other time happened during one of their trials and he almost succeeded. And of course they did on the command of Chase. Nope, not Chase, Chance. His name is Chance. He's the other lead instructor and definitely not someone I liked in this book. Did anyone like him? Really? Just, I'm not judging if you did. I mean, they are characters, they are not real people. There are certain characters that I like that I'm sure people just, it's just fiction, so it's fine, right? It's, it's fine. But back to Chance, he's so pissed at her about beating up his friend. 
He's ridiculous. And speaking of Cayman, I don't hate him by the end of this book. He has come around at least a tiny bit. He did accept the fact that she was Pantheon blessed. Like it didn't really bother him because she did kind of save their lives. And with his new rank, since his father is dead, oh, I'll get to that. He pretty much made everyone fall in line, including Chance. He also admitted that his father wanted her dead and that's why he went along with what Chance wanted him to do. I don't know, I don't hate him right now. It's not like I love him or anything. I just, he's, he's fine. I guess I'll see how I feel about him once I read the next book. Earlier on, we did learn that Akina was ignoring messages that she was receiving. She was receiving them from the Prince of Kanai. His name is Enoch. I was really wondering if we were going to get a love triangle between him and Reed. No, no, not quite. I, not happening. Now, I'm not really one to shy away from a love triangle. It's a trope that I actually don't hate. I don't care as long as it works. I'm good. And I know some of you might say that it never works, but I guess we can agree to disagree. Anyway, things definitely take a turn in the relationship between Akina and Anak when she tries to kill his father. Let me rewind a bit. So earlier on, there was a mention of a soldier always doing what they are told. Well, after Akina and her friends pass the trials, except for Zane, RIP, they all end up going over to Ganai, except for Selene. It's apparently time to ask for help. Remember how some of the people of Marine looked down on the people of Kanai? Well, apparently not enough to ask for their help in the war. I guess they're probably okay for Kanaians being killed off for them because reasons. Anyway, Akina sees Enoch and his family. This seems to be the first time she has spoken to them since her grandfather's death and they are all very nice to her. We have King Musaf who is the Grand Monarch of Kanai, Queen Akasha, Enoch the Crown Prince, and Princess Nishia. Akina is really glad to be around them and she does feel comfortable around them but then she finds out why Maureen is really there and what they ask her to do. They are there to kill Enoch's father the king. Kill the monarch and make it look like the Akasians invaded. They want to end up scaring the other Kanaians. And with the king out of the way, they'll have to go along with them, right? Because they'll definitely want to get the Akasians back. I'm sorry, what? Marine is here and all of a sudden you want me to believe the Akasians invade and kill the king? coincidence much? That is how much these people think of the Kanaians. They think they'll easily be swayed. And the kicker is they want Akina to do it. They have a recording of the king agreeing to help the Akasians or whatever. I just, I really wanted Akina to go to the king and queen and just talk to them. But she is a soldier and from Marine and she must do her duty. And she goes off to kill the king. Except he seemed to have sensed it and tricked her and it didn't happen. There was a blood gifted shapeshifter in his place. We meet a Johnny who was a member of the Red Order serving the Blood Emperor and one of the most powerful blood gifted outside the Emperor. And he doesn't allow for Akina to be killed because he realizes that she is blood gifted as well. Enoch is pissed about this. Makes sense. I mean, she did try to assassinate his father and all. Again, love triangle, not happening. At least not with them. At least Akina does end up getting revenge on the men that did kill her grandfather. They were the leaders of the Republic. Hamas Rossi, Zephar Khan, and Rudyard Brock. Yes, that same family friend, Rudyard Brock. The one that got her in this mess to begin with. All but Selene's father is there. And like I said earlier, Selene did not come with them to Kanai. She also told Akita earlier that she was going to pledge Epsilon and not Gamma. Again, I don't want to believe her betrayal. I don't, I don't want to do it. Nope, stop. I don't want to. I got you can't do it. I can't. There has to be another reason. I know, I know. Akina learned that the Republic knew about her blood gift and that is why her grandfather died. The Republic actually had developed a serum to go up against the blood gifted. Rissi and Warhouse recently engineered a bioweapon that can be used against the Akasian legions. Those tests are near complete and the bioweapon is proved to be effective in neutralizing the blood gift. And the pendant Selene gave her earlier actually depleted her blood gift. But let me stand over here and my Selene has a perfectly good explanation for all of this stance. 
just for a bit at least. Then comes Akina telling her friends about her blood gift. Oh wait, nope, nope, she doesn't get to do that. Enoch tells them. So Akina ended up making a deal with the Johnny, a blood oath. She pledged allegiance to him to get her friends out safely. She was going to tell her friends about her blood gift, but Enoch beat her to it. Oh, and he tried to kill her friends even though he wasn't supposed to. Which made Akina use her blood gift to control all the guards. Like she did with Kamen when he tried to attack her earlier. It is then mentioned that only the Blood Emperor can do a wide scale compulsion like Akina was currently doing. Related? Oh, I, I have a new theory. We'll get to that later. Now, Akina has to deal with her friends and comrades knowing that she is blood gifted. Some of them look at her like she is beneath them. Um, Some of y'all have been looking at her like that even before, so nothing has changed. So Akina finally accepts her gifts and truly embraces her blood gift when they are all in trouble. Then remember how Akina pledged herself to Ajani? Did you think she was just going to go along with him? Of course not. That wouldn't be Akina. She decides to go rogue instead. Along with her comes Cayman, Grayson, Cayman's friend, Reed, Danica, and Haynes. They run off into the sunset and live happily ever after. Just kidding. They're about to be hunted by all sides. And that's it for the blood trials. But I do have some theories I want to talk about. So number one, I first thought that Akina could be the blood emperor's daughter, but what if she is his granddaughter? What if Fern didn't manipulate genes to make her mother? I mean, it seemed a bit too easy for Vern to get the blood emperor to just sign a peace treaty at the time. There's definitely something else there. Another one I admit is a totally weird theory and please don't look at me strange. Are we gonna get a love triangle that consists of Reed versus Cayman? What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Again, I'm cool with love triangles. That would be an interesting choice though. I know Cayman came around a bit, but he still called her slurs early on. And I'm not really sure how much he's really changed. Even though I did say that I don't mind him. I don't know, I'm confused about all of this. Also, he doesn't know that Akina killed his father. He just knows that his father is dead. Maybe I'm reading too much into Cayman. I most likely am, just bear with me. Three. I don't want to think about theories with Celine. I just, I'm not ready for that. So yeah, we're gonna move on. Four, that blood oath Akina made with the Johnny is definitely going to come back on her since she decided not to fulfill the pledge. Maybe her and her friends will be on the run from him as well. I mean, they're gonna be on the run from everyone, so might as well add them to the bunch. But that is all I have for today. If you have read The Blood Trials, please let me know what you thought of the book. And also if you plan on reading the sequels, please don't spoil me though. I promise I'm going to read this book very soon. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and don't forget to like this video and subscribe. For more videos like this one, you can check out my recap of A Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Jackson. But I will see you all in a new video soon.